everybody, Nikki here with the Inside Story, and today we are doing chapter three of Anna Dressed in Blood by Kendare Blake. Um, so super excited. I'm really digging this one so far. Um, it kind of has supernatural um, vibes to it. So if you've ever seen Supernatural, the TV show, um, it's a great show. So I'm really excited to see where we're going to go with it. So let's get started. Chapter 3. The scenery changed fast once we crossed over into Canada, and I'm looking out the window at miles of rolling hills covered in forest. My mother says it's something called Boreal Forest, and recently, since we really started moving around, she's developed this hobby of intensely researching each new place we live. She says it makes it feel more like a vacation to know places where she wants to eat and things that she wants to do when we get there. I think it makes her feel like it's more of a home. She's let Tyball out of his pet care, and he's perched on her shoulder with his tail wrapped around her neck. He doesn't spare a glance for me. He's half Siamese and has that breed's trait of choosing one person to adore and saying screw off to all the rest. Not that I care. I like it when he hisses and bats at me, and the only thing he's good for is occasionally seeing ghosts before I do. My mom is staring up at the clouds, humming something that isn't a real song. She's wearing the same smile as her cat. Why the good mood, I ask. Isn't your butt asleep yet? It's been asleep for hours, she replies, but I think I'm going to like Thunder Bay, and from the looks of these clouds, I'm going to get to enjoy it for quite some time. I glance up. The clouds are enormous and perfectly white. They sit deadly still in the sky as we drive into them. I watch without blinking until my eyes dry out. They don't move or change in any way. Driving into unmoving clouds, she whispers, things are going to take longer than you expect. I want to tell her that she's being superstitious, that clouds not moving don't mean anything, and besides, if you watch them long enough, they have to move. But that would make a hypocrite of me, this guy who lets her cleanse his knife in the salt under moonlight. The stagnant clouds make me motion sick for some reason, so I go back to looking at the forest. A blanket of pines in colors of green, brown, and rust struck through with a birch trunk sticking up like bones. I'm usually in a better mood on these trips. The excitement of somewhere new, a new ghost to hunt, new things to see, the prospects usually keep my brain sunny for at least the duration of the drive. Maybe it's just that I'm tired. I don't sleep much, and when I do, there's usually some kind of nightmare involved. But I'm not complaining. I've had them off and on since I started using the Atham. Occupational hazard, I guess. My subconscious letting out all the fear I should be feeling when I walk into places where there are murderous ghosts. Still, I should try to get some rest. The dreams are particularly bad the night after a successful hunt, and they haven't really calmed down since I took out the hitchhiker. An hour or so later, after many attempts to, at sleep, Thunder Bay comes up in our windshield, a sprawling, urbanist city of over 100,000 living. We drive through the commercial and business districts, and I am unimpressed. Walmart is a convenient place for the breathing, but I've never seen a ghost comparing prices on motor oil or trying to jimmy his way into the Xbox 360 game case. It's only as we get into the heart of the city, the older part of the city that rests above the harbor, that I see what I'm looking for. Nestled in between refurbished family homes are houses cut out at bad angles, their coats of paint peeling in scabs and their shutters hanging crooked on their windows so they look like wounded eyes. I barely notice the nicer houses, and I blink as we pass and they're gone, boring and inconsequential. Over the course of my life, I've been a, a lot to lots of places, shadowed places where things have gone wrong, sinister places where things still are, and I always hate the sunlit towns, full of newly built developments with double car garages and shades of pale eggshell, surrounded by green lawns and dotted with laughing children. Those towns aren't any less haunted than the others, they're just better liars. I like it more to come to a place like this, where the scent of death is carried to you on every seventh breath. I watch the water of Superior lie beside the city, like a sleeping dog. My dad always said the water makes the dead feel safe, and nothing draws them more, or hides them better. My mom has turned on the GPS, which she has affectionately named Fran, after an uncle with a particularly good sense of direction. Fran's droning voice is guiding us through the city, directing us like we're idiots. Prepare to turn left in a hundred feet. Prepare to turn left. Turn left. Tybalt, sensing the end of the journey, has returned to his pet carrier, and I reach down and shut the door. He hisses at me like he could have done it himself. 
The house that we rented is smallish, two stories of fresh maroon paint and dark gray trim and shutters. It sits at the base of a hill, the start of a nice flat patch of land. When we pull up, there are no neighbors peeking at us from windows or coming out onto their porches to say hello. The house looks contained and solitary. What do you think, my mom asks. I like it, I reply honestly. You can see things coming. She sighs at me. She'd be happier if I would grin and bound up the stairs of the front porch, throw open the door and race up to the second floor to try and call dibs on the master bedroom. I used to do that sort of thing when we'd move into a new place with dad, but I was seven. I'm not going to let her road weary eyes guilt me into anything, and before I know it, we'll be making daisy chains in the backyard and crowning the cat the king of summer solstice. Instead, I grab the pet carrier and get out of the U-Haul. It isn't ten seconds before I hear my mom's footsteps behind my own. I wait for her to unlock the front door and then we go in, smelling cooped up summer air and the old dirt of strangers. The door has opened on a large living room, already furnished with a cream-colored couch and wing-back chair. There's a brass lamp that needs a new lampshade and a coffee and end table set in dark mahogany. Further back, a wooden archway leads to the kitchen in an open dining room. I look up into the shadows of a staircase on my right. Quietly, I close the front door behind us and set the pet carrier on the wood floor, and then I open it up. After a second, a pair of green eyes pokes out, followed by a black, slinky body. This is a trick I learned from my dad, or rather, that my dad learned from himself. He'd been following a tip into Portland. The job in question was the multiple victims of a fire in a canning factory. His mind was wound up with thoughts of machinery and things whose lips cracked open when they spoke. He hadn't paid much attention when he rented the house we moved into, and of course the landlord didn't mention that a woman and her unborn baby died there when her husband pushed her down the stairs. These are things one tends to gloss over. It's a funny thing about ghosts. They might have been normal, or re relatively normal, when they were still breathing, but once they die, they're your typical obsessives. They become fixated on what happened to them and trap themselves in the worst moment. Nothing else exists in their world except the edge of that knife, the feel of those hands around their throat. They have a habit of showing you these things, usually by demonstration. If you know their story, it isn't hard to predict what, predict what they'll do. On that particular day in Portland, my mom was helping me move my boxes up into my new room. It was back when we still used cheap cardboard and it was raining. Most of the box tops were softening like cereal and milk. I remember laughing over how wet we were getting and how we left shoe-shaped puddles all over the linoleum entryway. By the sound of our scrambling feet, you would have thought a family of hypoblumic golden retrievers were moving in. It happened on our third trip up the stairs. I was slapping my shoes down, making a mess, and had taken my baseball glove out of the box because I didn't want it to get water spotted. Then I felt it, something glide by me on the staircase, just brushing past my shoulder. There was nothing angry or hurried about the touch. I never told anyone because of what happened next, but it felt motherly, like I was being carefully moved out of the way. At the time, I think I thought it was my mom making a play grab for my arm, because I turned around with this big grin on my face, just in time to see the ghost of the woman change from wind to mist. She seemed to be wearing a sheet, and her hair was so pale that I could see her face through the back of her head. I'd seen ghosts before. Growing up with my dad, it was as routine as Thursday night meatloaf, but I'd never seen one shove my mother into thin air. I tried to reach her, but all I ended up with was a torn scrap of the cardboard box. She fell back, and the ghost wavering triumphantly. I could see Mom's expression through the floating sheet. Strangely enough, I can remember that I could see her back molars as she fell, the upper back molars, and that she had two cavities in them. That's what I think of when I think of that incident, the gross, queasy feeling I got from seeing my mother's cavities. She landed on the stairs butt first and made a little, oh, sound, and then rolled backward until she hit the wall. I don't remember anything after that. I don't even remember if we stayed in the house. Of course, my father must have dispatched the ghost, probably the same day, but I don't remember anything else of Portland. All I know is, after that, my dad started using Tybalt, who was just a kitten then, and Mom still walks with a limp on the day before a thunderstorm. Tybalt is eyeing the ceiling, sniffing the walls. His tail twitches occasionally, and we follow him as he checks the entire entirety of the lower level. I get impatient with him in the bathroom because he looks like he's forgotten that he has a job to do and instead wants to roll on the cool tile. I snap my fingers, he squints at me resentfully, but he does get up and continues his inspection. On the stairs he hesitates, 
I'm not worried. What I'm looking for is him to hiss at thin air, or to sit quietly and stare at nothing. Hesitation doesn't mean a thing. Cats can see ghosts, but they don't have pre precogni precognition. We follow him up the stairs, and out of habit, I take my mom's hand. I've got my leather bag over my shoulder. The Atham is a comforting presence inside, my own little St. Christopher's medallion. There are three bedrooms and a full bathroom on the fourth floor, plus a small attic with a pull-down ladder. It smells like fresh paint, which is good. Things that are new are good. No chance that, chance that some sentimental dead thing has attached itself. Tybalt winds his way through the bathroom and then walks into a bedroom. He stares at the dresser, its drawers open and askew, and regards the strip bed with distaste. Then he sits and cleans both forepaws. There's nothing here. Let's move our stuff in and seal it. At the suggestion of activity, the lazy cat turns his head and growls at me, his green reflector eyes as round as wall clocks. I ignore him and reach up for the trap door to the attic. Ow! I look down. Tybalt has climbed to me like a tree, and I've got both hands on his back, and he has all four sets of claws snugly embedded in my skin, and the damn thing is purring. He's just playing, honey, my mom says, and carefully plucks each paw off of my clothing. I'll put him back in his carrier and stow him in a bedroom until we get the boxes in. Maybe you should dig in the trailer and find his litter box. Great, I said sarcastically. But I do get the cat set up in my mom's new bedroom with food, water, and his cat box before we move the rest of our stuff into the house. It takes only two hours. We're experts at this. Still, the sun is beginning to set when my mom finishes up the kitchen witch business, boiling oils and herbs to anoint the doors and windows with, effectively keeping out anything that wasn't in when we got here. I don't know that it works, but I can't really say that it doesn't. We've always been safe in our homes. I do, however, know that it reeks like sandalwood and rosemary. After the house is sealed, I start a small fire in the backyard, and my mom and I burn every small knick-knack we find that could have meant something to a previous tenant. A purple beaded necklace left in a drawer, a few homemade pot holders, and even a tiny book of matches that look too well preserved. We don't need ghosts trying to come back for something left behind. My mom presses a wet thumb to my forehead, and I can smell rosemary and sweet oil. Mom. You know the rules. Every night for the first three nights, she smiles, and in the firelight, her auburn hair looks like embers. It'll keep you safe. It'll give me acne, I protest, but make no move to wipe it off. I have to start school in two weeks. She doesn't say anything. She just stares down at her herbal thumb like she might press it between her own eyes, but then she blinks and wipes it on the leg of her jeans. The city smells like smoke and things that rot in the summer. It's more haunted than I thought it would be, an entire layer of activity just under the dirt. Whispers behind people's laughter, or movement that you shouldn't see in the corner of your eye. Most of them are harmless, sad little cold spots or groans in the dark. Blurry patches of white that only show up in a Polaroid. I have no business with them, but somewhere out there is one that matters. Somewhere out there is the one that I came for, one who's strong enough to squeeze the breath out of living throats. I think of her again, Anna. Anna dressed in blood. I wonder what tricks she'll try. I wonder if she'll be clever. Will she float? Will she laugh or scream? And how will she try to kill me? Dun dun dun. All right, what are you guys' thoughts so far? So that was chapter three. Tomorrow we will have chapter four and I will be seeing you guys later. If you guys want to um, drop a comment and let me know what you guys think so far, or what spooky books you guys are reading this October, I would love to hear from you guys. Um, so I will see you guys tomorrow. Have a great rest of your day. Bye. <laughs>